five if there's any more. Hi, folks. Happy Thursday. Yeah, not rhetorical. I'm actually saying hello to everyone. Yeah, hello. So I just learned that the homework system that I got working yesterday worked it well enough for me to make a video about it and post it to YouTube and worked up until 10 o'clock this morning, apparently is throwing error messages. So I don't know what happened, but I will find out and fix it. Um, usually this error message means I screwed up something with the databases, but I didn't change anything about the databases. So this is going to be uh, something I will diagnose. Um, did anyone get a chance to try it by chance? Vladimir did, but you've already played with it before. Okay. So I have made a YouTube video demonstrating how to use it, and I wanted to uh, point out it today, but now that it's not working, I can't do that. So um, I will fix that and let you know. You get two points of extra credit for doing it. I had wanted it to be done by Monday, but it doesn't, like, if you do it late, I don't care. Like, it's, you can have two points of extra credit for doing it. Um, so I will let you know as soon as that is fixed. I have posted a new lecture for next week, and I'm yeah, almost finished with the corresponding example, so I will let you know when that is available for download as well. Um, this, the class from Tuesday, as you can see, there's a new entry in the box here for the video from that class. So every time that um, I finish a lecture and upload the video, then it will be posted to the corresponding day for what is covered. And I try to tell you in the parentheses here how far we got, so that can help you search through the material a little bit more efficiently. So that's, this is curious, but we will figure out what happened. All right, um, so we were talking about Legos last time. Any questions that occurred to you that you want to start with before we dive back into some stuff? No, we're good. Okay, so last time we talked about why it is that all of these different model names as listed here, for instance, on slide 16 are just special cases of one general thing. And it's not because of the predictors, it's because of this right here. All of these models have the same assumption about the variability of an outcome. The E residuals is what makes the general linear model a thing. We will talk more about the specifics of that next week. My goal today was just to give you a broader picture of how the material that we're going to learn fits into the rest of the world of statistics and in particular the classwork that you can potentially follow this class with. So we were talking about uh, my view of the Legos that form most of quantitative methods, which are four of them, linear models, estimation, link functions, and random effects and latent variables is the number four that, the, that this class doesn't quite get to. But the first ones we do get to. So we were on, I think, page 19 here? Slide 19, does that sound about right? I think so. If memory serves, could I share my screen? Hey, yeah, what a great idea! Why didn't I think of that? Thank you for letting me know. And now I'm checking the recording. Yes, it is recording. Thank you for the prompt. All right. Now we can see. Zoomers, are you with me? Excellent. I just learned, by the way, there is now a thumbs down button on Zoom. Someone out there heard my request. So, good deal. All right, so we're talking about Legos and linear models. So linear models is something that you will get a chance to review with me next week and practice throughout the semester. It's basically the ability to figure out what your predictor variables need to look like and what fixed effects of them need to be included in a model in order to answer all the questions that you have about the way those predictors relate to an outcome. It gets to be more complicated when we're dealing with not just what are known as main effects, like if you give a predictor a slope all by itself, but if you include a predictor as part of an interaction term in order to examine moderation, that's where it gets pretty tricky. But in order to build a linear model that would work for any kind of outcome in any kind of data set, there's extra pieces that are likely to be added. So what else we need is going to be a function of link functions, 
and dimensions of sampling. But in order to be able to add these components, we have to change the way that we're estimating a model. So the word estimation sounds a little bit scary. It means a way of finding the answers. There's a bunch of different ways in which the optimal answer to what a slope should be, what a standard error should be, comes back to you. The ones that you've probably seen up to this point are all classified as under what's known as least squares. The idea that the right answer is the one that minimizes the sum of the squared residuals at the end of the regression line that makes the variability the smallest is the rightest answer. Least squares is great. It was one of the first things to be developed. It can be done by hand, which is why it's one of the first things to be developed, but it's greatly limited in practice. So maximum likelihood is what we're going to be using this semester, which is what I want to talk about next. It picks up where least squares leaves off. So it affords you everything that least squares can do and then some. And then what has become increasingly popular and commonly used is Bayesian estimation, which is the combination of maximum likelihood plus prior distributions for all of the parameters. So you can think of these as kind of nested within each other. I'm sticking with maximum likelihood for this class because the material that we have is enough without adding that additional layer of estimation complexity. But once you understand the models, being able to estimate them in a way that adds prior information is just one additional layer of complexity beyond that. So ordinarily squares. This is the idea of like sums of squares for the model and sums of squares the residual and then you have your F test and all of that stuff. This is one way of getting the estimates for regression parameters, intercepts, slopes, variability left over. The good news is that maximum likelihood as a more general estimation technique, it's abbreviated ML, can find the answers with more flexibility and more kinds of data. So things that are outcomes that are not normal, for instance, you can't do least squares for those. When you have more than one outcome to be predicted from a person at the same time, multivariate analysis. Uh, when you have what's known as clustered data, which is when you have multiple dimensions of sampling in a study at the same time. So longitudinal data, for instance, where you have observations collected over time from different people. That's two dimensions of sampling at a minimum. If you have cluster data where we have, say, students who are nested within teachers and classrooms, and classrooms are nested within schools, which are nested within districts, like that would be four dimensions of sampling. Each of those dimensions potentially has variability that's explained and variability that's unexplained. So to do something like that requires maximum likelihood instead of least squares. Incomplete data. So what happens if somebody doesn't give you all of the information that you want to be in your model? Well, if you're in least squares land, you have to delete them. Even if they have six out of seven pieces of information, the seventh one is the deal breaker. And that's because you can't compute the sum of anything unless you have all the things to be summed over. Like sum of squares is the problem. Least squares estimation is the problem. But you can find the likelihood even if you don't have all the pieces of information. There is a specific variant of maximum likelihood that you may come across. Most of the time it will be in the context of multi-level models or longitudinal models. That's known as residual maximum likelihood, or REML is the way that we say that. That actually is literally the same thing as OLS. If you have complete cases and you're fitting a model for normal outcomes, you will get the exact same answers. Minimizing the sum of squared errors is the same thing as maximizing the likelihood. It's just a different way of approaching the problem. And so all of the OLS computations that you're used to seeing, like how do we find a mean? How do we find a variance? How do we find this and that? Those are just workarounds that someone figured out to simplify the maximum likelihood estimation process. So on your reading list are a couple chapters from uh, Craig Ender's Missing Data book. Not because I want you to read about missing data, but because his explanations of how maximum likelihood work are the clearest I've ever seen. So chapter three in particular introduces this idea of what it means, and it shows the connections to classical formulas for finding quantities that you'll already know. But the good news, maximum likelihood is height. 
So if you understand the concept of a ruler, you're good to go. That is all I need you to understand to be able to do this. So where does that ruler come from? Probability distributions as the engineering algorithm, the underlying piece here. So I stole this picture from Wikipedia. Does this look familiar? Or the words next to it? This is a normal distribution, otherwise known as Gaussian or a bell curve. Any kind of distribution, the purpose of it is to tell us how often something is likely to happen. Often, in the sense of discrete possibilities, like a coin flip having a probability of heads versus tails, you can say that that is like how frequently something is, what is the probability of this particular thing happening. For distributions where the range of possibilities is continuous, the analog is a word called likelihood. You can think of it as probability-ish. It, it means the same thing. So the purpose of a distribution then is to tell you how likely or how, how, what, by what probability, how frequently something is supposed to happen. So if I have, let's say that I have a score of two, okay? So I'm right here. How likely is a score of two depends on the distribution where that score came from. If that score of two came from this blue distribution that has a mean of zero, and this little thing right here, does that look familiar? You can see it. What usually come, comes next to the mean in normal distribution? Starts with a V. Variance, yeah, spread, right? Dispersion. This blue line was drawn by saying this distribution has a mean of zero and a variance of 0.2. So if my observation of two came from this blue, it's very, very unlikely. Very, very unlikely that I would get a two when the standard deviation is the square root of 0.2. If this observation came from the red one, now we're cooking with gas because that means that the variance from the red one is one. This is only two standard deviations away from the mean. About 95% of the people will be within that within the normal distribution. If it came from yellow, it's even more likely because yellow has a variance of five, which means even though it's at the mean as a central place, the same spot as red and blue, there's a lot more variability. There's a lot more dispersion around that mean. So any one case is going to be off from the mean by the square root of five for this yellow line here. And the difference in what is likely is conveyed by the y-axis here. Yellow is more likely because it's taller. Yellow is more likely than red, which is more likely than green or blue. Where this number on the y-axis came from is this equation right here. I don't need you to memorize this, don't worry. I still don't have it memorized, and this is my day job. I can tell you what goes in it, though. This is a 2. This thing is pi, which is a number, 3.14 or something. Then we have residual variance. Well, that's the idea of variance left over after we predict y from some stuff. e to the, another number, and then y minus y hat, that's how far off your observation is from the mean, and here's residual variance again. So all we need to know to calculate the height of any piece of data is what is their predicted outcome supposed to be, and what is the variance estimated by the rest of the model, and we get a height. So if we want to do this as a quick demonstration, we can do maximum likelihood estimation using Excel. So let's do it for an empty model. This idea of empty model means no predictors. Beta zero is a fixed intercept. If there's no predictors in the model, what's beta zero supposed to be? What's your best guess for someone's outcome if you know nothing else about them at all? The mean, right? That's what beta zero is going to be. E is how far off from the mean each observation is. So this equation is another way of representing the mean and variance of y. Because E is how far off from the mean, that's what we need is the ingredients to compute variance. So I have this on a slide here so that you can see it a little bit better, but I have the Excel file this came from posted on the website, and then I have it right here in front of me. So let's say that I have this pile of data right here. I have these observations. This is my outcome. 
Now I know what the true value is for the mean of these observations because I can compute it. There's a function in Excel called average. Of course it's not mean. I'm not sure why, but it's average instead. I can compute an average. I can compute the standard error of the mean because I know the formula for that as well. I can compute the variance of these observations and I can switch it to be the maximum likelihood estimated variance which divides by n rather than n minus 1. This number right here, I think I can make this part any bigger, but where that function came from, it's called norm dist. Here we go, now you can see it. It is the formula that I showed on the slide for the likelihood. So if these observations came from a distribution that has this mean and this variance, this is how tall this person's data is going to be. It's 0.04. This person, if they came from that distribution, they have a height of 0.07. In order to combine the heights across people, if you have independent events, in theory, you're supposed to be able to multiply these things together, right? Like if you have two coin flips and you want to compute the probability they're both heads or both tails or whatever, you can just multiply them because they're supposed to be independent. So if I believe that people are independent, then I can multiply all of these numbers together and get a combined height for everybody. But what happens when you multiply tiny numbers together? You know, they get tiny and tinier. And working with tiny, teeny, tiny numbers is very bad for machines because you can lose precision that way. So some genius was like, hey, I can fix teeny, tiny numbers. I'm going to take the natural log, which is LN in Excel. So now I have numbers that if you take the log of something that was supposed to be multiplied, you can add it together instead. So that makes the math part easier to keep track of and to be more accurate. So I can add all these things together and get one number that describes how tall everyone is. Question? Yeah, um, I was just wondering, what's normal underscore y? Normal underscore y? The column right next to the over. Mm, oh, this is a y generated from a normal distribution. Like the, In this example, it's normal. The other tabs have different distributions to them. So it's, it's literally made up data. <laughs> That's all. But the function I'm using is norm based. So if these data came from a normal distribution, this would be the height of each of these observations if this is the mean and this is the variance. So I take the log of each person's data. If I'm willing to say these people are independent, then I can sum all of those logs and I end up with this number right here. This number right here is going to become very important to us. It's called log likelihood. It is the combined height of everyone's data all at the same time. Our goal is to come up with the model parameters, which in this case are just the mean and the variance here, that make everybody's data the tallest all at the same time. So how did I know what the right answer is supposed to be? Well, because some genius already figured out how to calculate the mean and the variance from a normal distribution. But what if I didn't know? Well, I could try alternatives. So I come over here to the red column. What if I said, I think the mean is actually somewhere around 5.2. I'm going to try a different number, and I'm going to try a variance of 2 instead. Okay, well now I calculate the height using those numbers instead. And this person's data, not as tall. This person, not as tall. This person, not as tall. This person, taller. Okay, that's good. So some are going to be taller, some are going to be shorter. And this red line here shows the results of taking the log of each of these things and adding them together. So by saying that the variance is less and the mean is a little bit more, I made some people taller, but I made almost everybody else shorter. So like the net result is these are not as good a numbers. These are not the rightest answers that I can have. But this process of what if it were this? Now how tall is everybody? Did that get better? No. Okay, let's go back the other way. Let's change it this way. Did it get taller? Better? Okay, let's keep moving in this direction. That idea of searching through the possibilities of what the right answers could be and seeing which ones make the data the tallest collectively, that's maximum likelihood. Tall wins.
So this number right here that we're going to end up seeing on pieces of output, log likelihood, it only will have meaning relative to other possibilities for the same data. Like, I have no way of knowing if negative 23 is good. Doesn't sound good, right? Since when is negative numbers a good thing? Well, it's usually negative because we're in logs. Negative 23 is only good in that I know, well, it's better than negative 27 because it's taller. So log likelihood helps initially figure out what the rightest possible answers would be that make everyone's outcome data the tallest. And as we change the model to add more predictors, if a predictor helps, what do you think should happen to everybody's data? Taller or smaller? Taller. Taller, yeah. So how much taller we made the data is a standard for whether or not we've improved the model by adding things. Taller wins. So a lot of what you're initially taught that we have to assume about a model is because of what's happening under the hood here. Well, we are taught that if you use this model, you have to assume your E's are normal. Why? Because we're using the normal distribution to compute height. Do we have to use the normal distribution to compute height? No. There's all kinds of other ones. Why is it that we have to assume the E's are independent? Because this is the formula by which we're computing height, assuming the E's are independent. What if we have multiple E's that come from the same person? Well, we'd need to change the formula so that it's the height of one person's set of E's combined and then added to the, the height of the second person's set of E's combined so that we build in the relationships. But if you're willing to just say, we need the height, then you can find the height of anything. We just have to find the right distribution and the right way of computing height that matches the way the data were collected in terms of the sample. Most of this semester, we are still assuming independent observations because the focus is on different kinds of outcomes. But once you understand different kinds of outcomes, making it multivariate is just a switch in the way that height is computed. Okay, how are we doing so far? Taller wins. Log likelihood is the height of everyone's data all at the same time. The model parameters that are most likely are the ones that make everybody collectively the tallest. So, if normal isn't plausible, we pick a new formula for height. So we can change the distribution that we're using to compute height. We can change the way we compute it to allow observations from the same unit to be related as needed. Then the switch is, well, how do we make sure that the model predicts outcomes that are reasonable? That's where link functions come in as another new component here. So what are the kinds of outcome variables that one might potentially have in the social sciences? Well, one big discrepancy between continuous and other kinds is whether the other kinds are even numbers. Categorical predictors are variables, rather. So binary, and then I have dichotomous here in parentheses, I recently realized that these, to some people, are not synonyms. To some people, binary is two choices, and those two choices are only 0 and 1 whereas dichotomous is just two choices of anything. The idea that it's only two is the key, though. Nominal is another kind, unordered choices. Ordinal, ordered choices. So nominal might be like what kind of career choice someone makes, what your favorite sports team is, that kind of thing. Ordinal might be on a scale of strongly disagree to strongly agree, how much do you feel the University of Iowa supports your goals and dreams, right? Like we get these surveys. I just saw the results of the surveys about these things. A lot of those have numbers on them, but the numbers are attached to words. So ordinal, even if people give it numbers like one, two, three, four, those aren't numbers. They're not numbers in the same way that like temperature is a number or age is a number. 
Age ain't nothing but a number from what I understand, but <laughs> it is a number that means something, right? How many years on this planet you've been alive? I could attach these words to these numbers as labels and be equally valid. So the difference between strongly disagree and disagree in terms of a predictor or an outcome isn't necessarily the same difference between disagree and agree. So we can't really treat these as numbers, even if they kind of look like they could be. Uh, I am going to stick with the phrase categorical to describe these sorts of choices where we're talking about kinds and not amounts, but do know that they have many synonyms, such as a discrete variable, a qualitative variable, a grouping variable. In R, they're called factor variables. In SAS, they're called class variables. In SPSS, they're called fixed factors, like that's what the box is called you stick them into for whatever reason. In Stata, the code has them be I dots. So there's a lot of synonyms for this, but it basically boils down to, is this number really a number or is it a kind? Among variables that are numbers, we have to watch out when trying to predict them for whether or not they have boundaries. So the normal distribution is a continuous distribution with no boundaries. It predicts that the further out from the top of the curve you go, the less likely it is, but it keeps going forever and ever, like in theory. Most of the variables that we work with that are numbers don't work like that. So for instance, a binomial type of variable, like test scores, how many items did you get correct on the test? What's the worst you can do? No items correct, right? Can you do worse than no items correct? Maybe, but I don't know that the, how that would work. Maybe if you give a really, really wrong answer, they give you negative points or something. Like, I get negative three correct. No, most of the time it doesn't work like that. Although I want to say maybe like a long time ago, the SAT or the ACT was scored that way. Does that sound right in testing people? Yeah, like you get penalized for wrong answers. Dang, that's harsh. What's the best you can do? All of them. So 100% traditionally is the best you can do, except in this class, because I give out extra credit for trying homework zero, so you can get 102% if you want to. Point of the story, there's edges, right? So whatever model that you're building has to understand, I can't predict anything below zero correct and 100% correct. And whether you're thinking of it as percent correct, where you adjust for how many questions there are or just number correct is irrelevant to this discussion. There are edges, point being. Counts is another type of variable that's special in that it has an edge, one boundary, so the lowest count you can possibly have is zero of something. But counts are also only discrete, like you can't have one and a half of something that's a count variable. So we need a different kind of distribution that understands that at the end of the day, you're supposed to predict you know, one or two or three or four in terms of like how likely something is. There are special names attached to different types of count distributions. So this is unit three in this class, I think. So if you have a variable in which there are no zeros theoretically possible, that's called a zero truncated or zero altered count. That could happen if you're in a data set where in order to be in the data set, you have to have at least one instance. So if you have something like, um, you know, number of days spent in a hospital and you get your data set from a hospital, everybody who's in the data set was in the hospital by definition at least one day. So there's nobody who was never in the hospital in your data set. An opposite problem is if there's more zeros than expected. So this can happen anytime you're mixing populations together. We talked about this on Tuesday if and how much. Like if you have a population of smokers and non-smokers and you ask them how many cigarettes did you smoke today, you're going to get a giant pile of zeros from the non-smokers and some kind of distribution from the smokers. Now is it possible that someone is a smoker and they didn't have cigarettes on a given day? Sure. Those would be considered expected zeros. Then there's all the other zeros that are unexpected because they come from a different kind of population. So these models where it gets tricky is trying to figure out predicting who's an expected zero versus an unexpected zero. 
If you've heard of hurdle models, that's another thing that falls into this, or two-part models, those are related to the same idea of if and how much. And then there's also something called censored, where there's a boundary even though there's not supposed to be. So in medical settings, like how long until something happens to somebody? How long until relapse or how long until you quit your job? Well, what if you never relapse or quit your job? Then the best you can do is however long the study happened for, and that's, that's the end. So that's a special case of what's known as a censored outcome, and there are models that try to predict, okay, so I know that you couldn't possibly have a score above this boundary, I'm going to predict, like, maybe what if you could. What would it look like if you could? That's the idea of censored here. So any of these could potentially be predicted by pretending the outcome is normal. But in addition to the distribution not matching, we have to make sure the model understands the predictions have to stay within the boundaries. And that's where the problem breaks in. That's where link functions come in. Okay. How are we doing? I'm going to pause here and reload. So this class, the models in this class, is going to have three parts, three pieces of things that we need to fit any model. Link functions, linear models, and conditional distributions for the actual data. So we're going to go greatly in depth with this this semester, but this is the big picture of what these things are for. A link function is a transformation of the outcome to be predicted. It's designed to make sure that the predicted outcome stays within the boundaries that are possible given the way the variable is measured. It reels it back in, essentially. It's like a leash for your data. It's like, hey, come back here. You can't go past one. Stay right here. Linear models, you already know, and we'll continue to practice. How does the outcome get predicted by other pieces of information about a person? Whatever predictor variables you want to and whatever combinations make sense. The third piece, then, is what's known as a conditional distribution, where conditional means left over. After building your predicted outcome, you're always going to be wrong to some extent. So that idea of how far off is your real outcome from the one that's predicted, that's the idea of, of residual. What those residuals look like, then, is a choice you get to make in terms of what that condition, conditional distribution should be. So right now, if all you know is a general linear model, like traditional multiple regression and ANOVA, the only conditional distribution you've seen is normal. That's where people start. That's not where you have to stay, though. Likewise, the normal distribution is usually paired with what's known as an identity link function. And that is a fancy way of saying times one. No transformation. So the normal distribution then says the E's are supposed to be continuously distributed and go on forever and ever like this. The absence of a link function says there's no need to make sure we transform the predicted outcome to keep it within the boundaries because there's no boundaries. So those are the two new pieces that we have to change to adapt a standard regression model to work for any other kind of outcome. So here is a little bit about the idea of link functions. Let's say that I'm predicting a binary outcome. Let's say I'm predicting something fun like mortality, whether or not a patient ends up dying or living as a consequence of some disease process, where I have one as someone who's, who ended up dying and zero for someone who did not. So if I have a binary variable, the mean of that binary variable is the proportion of cases who have a one. What's the probability that any one person is going to die? Basically, that's what the model's trying to predict. Well, let's say that I have some, you know, important covariate that I want to put in here, and I think that there's a relationship between mortality and this x variable. So I fit beta 1 as a slope for it. So according to this picture, the slope is 1. And at all values of x, I can compute a predicted outcome. Now, here's the problem. If I have an x of 11, what do I call this? A probability of 1.2. Like, really dead. Not just dead. Super duper dead. 
Likewise, an X of one, really not dead? Grateful to be alive? I don't know, like wh where do you go with that? So this can't make any sense. And the further over the mean is of the probability towards these boundaries, the more this is a problem. So what if we just said, hey, you know that, that straight line that I made? Let me do it this way for you guys. I can't do spatial reasoning. There we go. Does that work right? No. It's this way. This way? This one. Okay, thank you. I have a severe, severe deficit for anything that comes with spatial reasoning or this. Okay, here's my line. What, can I just get you to like take that line and just kind of like shut it off a little bit on this side and kind of even it out on this side a little bit, just kind of bend it so it understands that it can't go out of the boundaries? Yeah. Like that? Yes. One of those, please. That's what I need. Okay, here's how we do it. Our new best friend, the logit. Otherwise known as log odds. Have you heard of this before? A little bit? Yes? People like, I know what a logit is. Or have you just heard of logit and you thought, what the hell's a logit? That one? Well, no, I know what logit is. Just... Okay, cool. Yeah, so logit is a really important concept and it shows up in a lot of advanced statistical models, including item response models for measurement. And I did not have the great fortune of having an understanding of logits before I took that class in graduate school. So I took this class on item response modeling, which is measurement latent variable models for predicting binary outcomes. And the instructor kept saying things like, the model's linear in the logit, and that's what makes it good. And I'm sitting there like a second year grad student, don't want to look stupid. What the hell's a logit? Does anybody even know what a logit is? No one knew what a logit is. And then, I somehow graduated, right? They, they let me out. You know, they can't take it back now. Don't tell them. And then as a postdoc, I audited some classes at Penn State, and one of the things they covered was logistic regression, which is what this slide is about. And the person explained what a logit was. I was like, oh my God, that's what a logit is. This all makes sense now. So my hope is that you get the logit part first, and then all of the uses of the logit down the road, you're like, okay, that makes a lot more sense. But what a logit does is change the outcome to be predicted from something that has boundaries to something that is unbounded. So the first step is we take the probability of a one, divide it by the probability of a zero. That piece inside the parentheses here is what's known as odds. Like what are the odds? that you're gonna survive this class, 100 to one. If we take the natural log of this ratio in parentheses here called odds, this end result quantity is what's known as a logit or log odds. And it has a center point at zero because if the numerator is 0.5 and the denominator is 0.5, that's a zero. So that's 50-50 probability is a logit of zero. But logits go on forever and ever. So now, this linear model, we can use just like we're used to. It predicts the logit instead. But if you back translate this prediction into probability, this is the picture that gets created. Because the higher and higher a predicted logit goes, it doesn't result in the same increase in probability the successive increases in probability get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller the higher up you go, and the same thing happens on the low end. So the end result is that we can talk about the same old regression model in the usual way. Beta zero, that's my expected intercept. Okay, what's an intercept? Intercept is the expected y when x is zero. Okay, what's y? Y is a logit. That's the only catch. You're in logits. Beta one, what's a slope? change in y for a one unit change in x. Okay, change in logit y for a one unit change in x. So we're changing the scale of the outcome to be predicted inside the model so that the resulting quantities stay within bounds. It's not a data transformation. It's a transformation of the mean to be predicted. So other link functions you may have heard of. Logit, Probit, Tobit, log, 
log log, complimentary log log. Um, I'm trying to think of others. Uh, that's the end of my list. I think that, that covers almost everything that I've seen before. They all have different purposes. So the logit's job as a link function is to keep the predicted outcomes within bounds. Now the other piece of this, if you have a binary outcome, the ease from that can only go in two directions. Like here's my prediction. Either I'm off by this much if I actually had a one, or I'm off by this much if I had a zero. That's it. There's only two choices. For every single possible prediction, you're off this way or that way. So the E's can't possibly be normal, and they can't possibly have constant variance as a result of that. So to solve that problem, we say, okay, well, the normal distribution isn't going to fit for that. Let's pick a new one. Turns out there's one made, custom made, for binary data, and it's called Bernoulli. In IntroStat, you may have seen this with coin flips and stuff like that because this is a special case of binomial when you only have one trial. Bernoulli is the simplest possible distribution you can have. The height of any observation is the probability of a 1, if that's what you got, or the probability of a 0, if that's what you got. The end. So if I know that, say, 25% of my cases got a 0, then then I know how many got a 1. Like if I'm on the screen line, if I know that 25% have a 0, how many percent have to have a 1? This is not a trick. If this is 0.25, what's this one? 0 0.75, because there's only two possibilities. So in this distribution, there's no separate variance. We don't need it. In the Bernoulli distribution, variance is a function of the mean. It's the probability of a 1 times the probability of a 0. So if, for instance, I have a variable that is 50-50, the variance is 0.25. That is the most variance a binary variable can possibly have. As I get skewed, I head in one direction or the other with the mean, the variance shrinks correspondingly to the point where if everybody got a 1, that's not a variable, that's a constant. So in this distribution, we don't have a separately estimated variance. So we change the assumption that we're making to not normal ease, but Bernoulli ease with non-constant variance. Turns out, there's a formula for that too. So here's my binary data, some zeros and some ones. I know what the right answer is because I know how to do the mean in Excel. 60% of my cases here have a 1. There's my variance. Now my formula for height. Let's see if I can, yep, there, I can make it bigger. It's the probability of a 1 if that's what you got times the probability of a 0 if that's what you got. So I don't need a function for it. I can just write out the formula based on the likelihood. But it's the same concept. This is how tall this person's data is if this is the mean and that's the variance. And you notice something in common here? Like, they're all the same height because it's the same number. So the right answer for the, the best height for those cases is this blue line here. If I put in the wrong answers, some people get taller, most people get shorter. But the idea of height of everybody as being our evidence for what set of parameters are the rightest for this data, log likelihood, same concept. The right answers are the one that collectively make everybody the tallest. The difference is how we're defining tall. Tall is being defined by a different distribution that better matches the potential values that the outcome can have. Mr. Potato Head, don't like this mouth? Okay, let's plug in a new one. Let's plug in these eyes, let's plug in this nose. We'll make it work. Here's binomial, which is another one we're going to talk about. Here's beta, which is an ugly one. So these are the ones that I bothered to program into Excel, but I could probably do more. Question? Was it by 
high in salary. Um, mm -hmm. So you said the reason why we do log too high is because we don't want to deal with the small number. Yes. But we want to make them bigger. We don't want to multiply tiny numbers. That's that's the key. Okay. Um, because they get tinier and tinier the more there are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this one, why we still using the log? Because I don't feel there is a big difference. Like usual logs don't make the number much bigger. In this case, you might not need to, but in terms of all of the software that's built to do these things, the log is just like built into it as a standard process. So we're always dealing with log likelihood, and the right answers are the, are the values that collectively make the outcomes the tallest. That's the key concept. So here it's the old multiple. Yeah, so there is such a thing as likelihood. Like you could multiply them all together, and the numbers that make that the tallest would be the same numbers that make the log likelihood the tallest. Like the standard is the same, it's just it would be on a different scale because it's likelihood and not log likelihood. So eventually we will be doing what's known as model comparisons. The idea, if, if I add this stuff, does it help? The answer to does it help is how much taller did you get? Where the difference between models is actually treated as a chi-square distributed variable. So then we use a chi-square distribution to, to judge whether something got enough taller to warrant keeping it. Question? And would you, like, would you make that comparison between, like, let's say, like, normal versus, like, binary, like, ethnicity? No, it's within a family. Okay. So within one, like, formula for height, we can see if changing the model made the data taller. But we can't compare across because it's different versions of height. It would be like this is centimeters and this is inches. It doesn't work. In, in very few cases could you compare like across. You'd have to do it with a different way. Um, but within a family, you can tell what, basically if a model helped by seeing whether or not it made something taller. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Height it is. Fun with Excel. So here's our list. This is all the stuff we're going to talk about in the first four units of this course. Link function, keep the outcomes prediction in bounds, conditional distribution, make sure that the residuals um, match like how they would actually behave based on the outcome. So the way that we compute height matches the possible outcomes a variable would have. Starting with binary, because it's the easiest and you really can't be wrong. We'll do logits and a few, look at a few others and pair that with a Bernoulli distribution. Ordinal and nominal outcomes, those tend to be used as logits and most commonly. And then the distribution for that is something called multinomial, which means more than two categories, but it's still categorical and there's no variance involved. Sometimes you'll hear the phrase multinomial regression. Have you heard of that before? It's kind of a bad name because it refers to the distribution and not what's being predicted, but they mean nominal. So regression models for predicting which category somebody's in, that's a multinomial regression. Uh, proportions. So proportion correct, where some people might get all of the answers correct and you might have like a pile up, otherwise known as a ceiling effect, or a pile up at the bottom known as a floor effect. Logit fixes that as well but pairs with a binomial distribution instead for predicting the probability of any correct answer. Counts tend to have log links instead. So the natural log makes it so that the predicted outcome stays above zero. So it's a one boundary link function rather than two. The count outcomes tend to have distributions from the Poisson family. By the way, this word is apparently a French word. It means fish, I think. Any French speakers in here? To me, it looks like poison spelled wrong. I'm currently reading my son a chapter book about Pokemon in which one of the characters is poison. And every single time I see the word, I have to stop myself from saying poison because that's where my head is at when I'm reading bedtime stories. But poison, it rarely fits for count data by itself. You usually have to add something to it because counts tend to be skewed because you can only have a boundary of zero, but the most you can have is infinity. So then we pull into something that's called negative binomial, which is like a stretchy Poisson that has this extra thing that allows it to come out a little bit more, and it allows the variance to exceed what's predicted by Poisson. 
censored data is something called Tobit, which is actually named after a person. It's like, I forget what it was exactly, but it's like Tobin's Probit or something, and they put it together and called it Tobit. This is like, I know you have a boundary here because of the way you collected the data, but what if you didn't? Like Tobit tries to predict what it would have been if you could have kept going, and it does so using a normal model for what it should have been and or Bernoulli for predicting who is likely to be at that boundary as a separate outcome. Skewed continuous data, things like response times. Response times are normally positively skewed, right? Because you can't be faster than zero, but you can be really, really slow if you want to be. So that tends to be used with the log link so that you keep the predicted response times above zero, but then maybe a log normal or another distribution called gamma that addresses the skewness and the fact that it can't go below zero. And then zero inflated as another set of possibilities. So you can predict like who's a zero and then who is part of the non-zero distribution and how much if so. So these things are all like readily established. We just have to know how to access them in software. And it's like plug and play. I'm gonna plug a logit here and this distribution here and then my usual regression model works just the way it's supposed to be. It's pretty magical. So yeah. From that point forward, once we figure out which link function and which distribution, everything else is pretty much the same. Intercepts are intercepts, slopes are slopes. It's just they're predicting the logit or the log instead of the original outcome. So there's a few differences that I want to prepare you for. As I mentioned last time, the specific model names that go with different combinations of predictors are not a thing. Like, we do not change what we're calling our analysis based on whether our predictor is a grouping variable or a continuous variable. That's not a thing. <clears throat> we're interpreting the outcome variable in a link, so it's the logit and whatnot. So the logit of the probability, for instance, or the log of the count is what the outcome is according to the model. Because most normal people will be like, what the hell is a logit? We have an extra step, usually, of translating those predictions back into something that people know what the hell it is. Like if I told you your probability of getting this thing to happen to you was 0.8, you would know that that's pretty high. If I told you that your probability corresponds to a logit of two, you'd be like, is that good? Like, I don't know what a logit is. Most people don't. So we have to back translate what's known as an inverse link function into the original metric of the variable that we're dealing with in terms of what's being predicted, like the probability or the count. We're still going to have significance tests that use things like t's and f's, but we're not going to find them using sums of squares. Sums of squares is gone. It's all about likelihood at this point. All of the parameters are going to result from the process according in their standard errors as well. But whether or not we end up using degrees of freedom is going to vary by software. And in most cases, we are not in this class because I went away from SAS. So why does this matter? Well, if you have, let's say, a regression slope, the first column of your output is estimate, right? What is the slope estimate? Like it's two. What's the next column? This way, right? Estimate. What's the next column usually? Standard, Standard error. What is the expected inconsistency of that slope across samples? The next column over, usually a quantity that is estimate divided by standard error, right? That gets either called T or Z. It's the same quantity either way. The question is, are you using denominator degrees of freedom to figure out where the 5% line is? If you're not, we call that Z. If you are, we call that T. So what shows up on your output is sometimes going to be T and sometimes going to be Z based on this distinction, and it's software specific what you get. Likewise, if you lump together multiple slopes and do a significance test of their joint combination, if you're using degrees of freedom, that's F. If you're not, that's chi-square. So there'll be these little pieces of things that might look a little different and it's because of differences in the use of denominator degrees of freedom. The other last thing, R square after our general linear models unit next week is gone. 
just say goodbye to it. It was nice. It was useful. It's no longer part of our story. Because here's the thing. If you have a normal distribution, that has a variance, right? We can compute that. It's a separately estimated parameter. It has nothing to do with the mean. And we can say, all right, how much of the variance is reduced after putting in this slope and that slope and that slope? And there's R squared. Well, what about if we have a binary outcome? The Bernoulli distribution doesn't have a variance in it. There is no variance. Like, it's not estimated because it doesn't need to be. It's determined by the mean. Not only is it determined by the mean, but it changes based on what the mean is. So there's no direct way to talk about variance explained when you don't have a starting point for how much variance was there in the first place. So effect size is usually done differently as a consequence of the lack of a, of a true R square. So each of these models has a different way of doing effect size. To start with, it's going to be taking the logic coefficient and taking the log off of it, unlogging it, or what's known more formally as exponentiating it, and that forms something, for instance, called an odds ratio. So there's new versions of effect size that are model specific because they go with the particular link function that's being used. R square is gone after after our review with next week. So these little these little things make it a little bit different sometimes to interpret the output, but the basics of what you learned in terms of what the model estimates are doing is the same. They're just going to be predicting logits and logs and stuff like that. Okay. How are we doing? I gotta take a breath here. I can feel myself like getting all like amped. So I have on here things that people used to do before generalized linear models became readily available. I would put everything on this slide in the category of last resort. Transforming data. We don't fit the data. We don't change the data to fit the model. We change the model to fit the data. Not everything has to be normal, and not everything's going to be normal. So that shouldn't be a goal anymore. So these are things that people used to do to try to make uh, either a distribution for normal residuals more plausible or to make variance stay the same across the predicted values. We don't necessarily need to do these things anymore. Also in this category for me is non-parametric statistics. This used to be a standard way of addressing violations of non-normality. But all of these techniques rely on least squares estimation, which means you have to make other compromises and assumptions. Like, this variable is not normal, but it has to be the same flavor of not normal across all the groups you're going to compare. Like, that's not terribly helpful. So we don't do any of this stuff in this class. These are sort of older things that are less useful nowadays than they used to be. The end of the class, I think we're, cl we're closing in. Yeah, three slides left. I'm actually going to hit my time today. Do you know how exciting it is when I actually plan enough time for the slides I wrote? Like, that never happens. So you will see on our syllabus, like, lecture one continued. You know, it's like, two days? Maybe three? I don't know, but I think I'm going to hit it today. So units five and six, then, are transitioning from univariate models to multivariate, where what those words mean is how many outcomes per person are you predicting at the same time? One is univariate. So it doesn't matter how many predictors you have, by the way. It's outcomes that we're talking about. More than one, multivariate. There are a lot of data collection designs and research questions that need multivariate models, such as when Y you're thinking of as a single outcome conceptually, but you have more than one per person. So if I'm measuring um, health over time, Right? I'm thinking of health as like one thing in my head, but the overtime part, health at the first occasion, health at the second occasion, health at the third occasion, that makes it multivariate. Likewise, if I have an experiment and I want to see how well you're able to do homework in silence versus Metallica versus classic music, right? I might think of homework performance as my outcome, but I've got three of them. And, I'm, and the whole point of the study would be to see how much better you are at doing homework when you play Metallica. Maybe that's my hypothesis, maybe not yours. Personally, when I'm doing homework type things, I listen to easy listening music from the 70s. And everyone can mock me for that, and I don't care. 
Give me the Eagles and America any day of the week. That's what I code to. If you have dyadic or family data, we talked about that last time as well, and when your hypotheses involve more than one outcome. So let's say that you're doing an intervention design and you believe that your intervention should help students better handle their depression and their anxiety. But maybe you predict that your intervention is going to have a bigger impact on depression than anxiety. That's a testable hypothesis, only if you predict both at the same time and you see if one slope is bigger. So that requires a multivariate model to be able to answer that kind of question. Likewise, mediation triangle. I think that being in the intervention group is going to make you better at coping, and the fact that you're better at coping is going to affect your depression. Like that kind of idea of a sequence of things. Coping being both an outcome of the intervention and a predictor of the eventual outcome means it's both a predictor and an outcome at the same time. That takes a multivariate model to do everything. There are ways to piece it together in separate analyses, but those tend to be um, less useful than, they, than otherwise doing it at once. Let's put it that way. So for multiple outcomes, any kind of repeated measures analysis that, that uses least squares quickly becomes useless. So in the world of least squares, like sums of squares model and sums of squares residual, can you analyze longitudinal data that way? Yeah. But in order to be able to compute the sum across something, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not loud enough to overcome the people in the hallway. Unfortunately, this is top volume. This is, this is all I got. Um, in order to compute the sum of squares of various anythings, you have to have all the data. So what if you do your longitudinal study and somebody comes five times and they don't show up for the sixth session? Bye-bye. You don't get to keep them. That sucks. That's called listwise deletion. Likewise, if you're, if you're studying siblings and you have like, you know, the younger child and the older child and the older child doesn't do all the things, bye-bye family. So listwise deletion becomes a problem not just with respect to power and sample size, but also with respect to who are the people who are diligent enough to come back all the times? And are those like a random subsample or are they different somehow? Different somehow is probably going to be the answer. The other way that it's a problem is that you have many fewer choices as to how you model the relationship between the outcomes from the same person. There's like two choices and that's it. And everybody has to be on the same schedule. So we're switching to doing these types of multivariate analyses using maximum likelihood, residual maximum likelihood where possible. And that's going to require a switch in software to some extent. So for the last unit of the course, we'll be heading more into path analysis type programs, which is M+. If you haven't already done so, if you're used to using the virtual desktop, check to see if you have access to M plus inside it when you log in because not everybody does by default. If you don't know what that is yet, um, that is uh, one of the things that you'll need to use if you want to do Stata, for instance, and you don't have a copy. Um, I have videos posted on the course website for how to get started on virtual desktop that were published for my intermediate stats course because that was the first time that folks used it. So at the end of the semester, we'll be moving to those software packages for now, it's Stata and R. All right. So then the three Legos that I hope that you will have at the end of this semester, the idea of linear models well ingrained. Because no matter how complicated your model is, you have to figure out what your predictors are, how they go in the model, and how they answer your questions. Link functions allows you to predict any kind of outcome, no matter what its distribution looks like, whether it's a number or a count or what have you. Maximum likelihood estimation makes all of that possible, but alongside that flexibility comes new vocabulary and procedures, such as looking at the log likelihood of a model and asking, does this get taller if I do X, Y, or Z to it? But those three features then are then going to allow you to add the fourth Lego a lot more easily. So combining those three things with either random effects or latent variables, depending on the context, that is essential for understanding how multi-level models work, or what are known as mixed effects models, 
factor analysis, structural equation models, item response models, and these are all of the courses that would feature this fourth Lego, random effects and latent variables, as the new part. So my hope at the end of this semester is that not everything is new at the same time. We can get through the first three this semester, then these other things will be much easier for you if you decide to keep going. And if not, then at least you've learned how to predict any kind of outcome you want to in a univariate or multivariate model. And that's it. All right. 307. Nailed it. Questions before we call it a week? Yeah. Hit me. Can you explain the denominator, the X? So, so the test statistic that you get for, for instance, testing whether or not a slope is different than zero. If you're testing one slope, then estimate over standard error is either a T or a Z in terms of the distribution you compare it to to figure out where like 5% probability lies. If that distribution changes as a function of sample size, basically that's the primary ingredient, denominator degrees of freedom, like T gets flatter, the, the fewer denominator degrees of freedom you have, the fewer people you have, area like further on out. So what the critical value would be for calling something significant if you're using T changes based on how many people you have. It does not change if you're using Z because Z doesn't care about that. So I'm saying, I'm warning you that like the way that you think about hypothesis testing is going to be informed as to whether or not denominator degrees of freedom are being used if they are, everything's a T or an F. F is for testing more than one slope at the same time. We'll talk about that next week. If they're not, it's Z's and chi-squares. So I just want to prepare you that it's going to look a little different, but it's the same ideas. Numerator degrees of freedom, by the way, is the number of things being tested. So if you test one slope, then it's T or Z because they have numerator degrees of freedom one, whereas F and chi-square can have as many as you need. Okay, other questions? Yes? Uh, not as much content related, but I, I had a question about homework zero. Homework zero, yes. Yes, um, I was wondering if that would be something that is posted on Icon or is that something that... Huh. So homework zero is um, within the same homework system that you're going to be using throughout the semester. I put it up yesterday, I recorded a video on how to use it today, and it was working until about 10 o'clock, and then after that I heard that there's error messages and the portal's not open. So I need to figure out why it went down and fix it. But homework is not inside ICON unless it's a written assignment for homework five. It's gonna be in this separate uh, machinery that, that, we, that I've made. So I will let you know as soon as that is fixed, and then you can do it along with the YouTube video that I think it's like a seven minute video. That's the most it could possibly take you. Um, it's just designed to get you, it's, it, homework zero is over the syllabus, so the questions are all super easy and short. It's just designed to get you used to how to interact with it. But unfortunately, it broke at some point from this morning until now, so I will fix it. Now it's working. Now it's working? You're yeah. shitting me. Okay, great. Well then, in like the two seconds I have left here, I'm gonna pull it, oh, pull it up. For advanced, it's working. For advanced, it's working, but not this class? I'm not sure because I've not tried for this class, but okay. for advanced, it's working. Okay, now we got this far before. It's up! It fixed itself magically! Okay, so what I did, very briefly here, I can tell you got your coats on and you're like out the door, so I promise I'm not going to keep you late. On, well, online homework system is here. The video watching me do it is right here. There's the link. So you log in with the last name that is in your Maui account. So if you have a hyphenated last name or, or two last names with a space, enter that. The one that I use, I have a bunch of dummy, dummy logins here for testing purposes. You enter your eight-digit ID. So I already did the homework as part of my... Um, my demonstration. Let me find one that I didn't do. One second. I'll be number three. Spelled correctly. That will help. Okay. Number three hasn't done this yet. 
So the system here has computational questions and results questions, like how many homeworks do we have this semester? I'm going to put in seven because I know that's the wrong answer. Hit enter. It's wrong. The right answer is six. Hit that. Now it's green. So every piece of output that I ask you about, you put in the number, it turns red or green. There's also drop-down paragraph completion items, such as where my office is. The one catch to this that I will warn folks about, at the bottom here, once you've decided that everything is saved, by the way, you can exit and come back and finish later and your work is saved. You don't have to do this in one fell swoop. If you hit submit final answers, at the bottom, you can either go back and change something if you change your mind, or if you're ready to submit for real, you have to re-enter your eight-digit ID. That way you can't submit it before you're ready. So the system has memory. Every time you log in, all of your work is saved. All of the choices you made previously are saved. And after the due date passes, you'll be able to see whether your answers that haven't been graded yet are correct, and if not, what they should have been. So I walked through this process on the YouTube video. Let me know, please, if you can't access it because it won't take your last name. Occasionally, we have issues with like people who have really long last names, and I had to change uh, the entry in the database to correspond to that. But that's the only catch that I'm expecting now that it's up. Weird. Okay. There, 313. I promised I wouldn't keep you late. Does that answer your question? Excellent. Thanks for bringing that up. I'm glad it's working again. Okay. I will let you know when example one is ready for next week. Otherwise, you get to work on this, and have good weekends. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Bye, Zoomers. That is so weird. Yeah. Because it, it couldn't find the database. And I'm like, I know the database is there because I've already done the homework. <sighs> yeah, this morning I tried once when I saw that you uploaded the video.